Hi, I'm Kenny Tallarico. We're going to be talking today about the Hayward Shepherd Monument down in Harpers Ferry, West Virginia. So this is a photograph from October 10th, 1931. It's a crowd of about, of about 400 people gathered in Harpers Ferry to unveil a peculiar monument. The monument honored Hayward Shepherd, the first victim of John Brown's 1859 raid. The monument, which was a four-ton boulder, was funded and erected by Confederate heritage organizations, most notably the United Daughters of the Confederacy. What makes this monument such a historical oddity is that Shepard, honored that day by organizations dedicated to the cause of the Confederacy, died a free Black man. And here is the monument itself. I'll direct your attention to about halfway through the second paragraph where it says it's a memorial to Hayward Shepherd who exemplified the character and faithfulness of thousands of Negroes who under many temptations throughout subsequent years of war, et cetera. Notice that word faithfulness, that is central to what this monument is doing. So not much is known for certain about Hayward Shepherd, the man. He was born in Winchester, Frederick County, Virginia, sometime in the mid 1820s to a well-established free black family. He worked as the B&O Porter in Harper's Ferry, which was a desirable position. He was reasonably well off and respected by the community. In 1859, he was worth upwards of $15,000, which was over $400,000 in today's money. His boss was also the mayor of the town who often left Shepherd in charge of the station. That was the case on the evening of October 16th, 1859, when John Brown and his band of 18 men came to town. So Brown was a radical abolitionist who came to Harper's Ferry that night to incite what the white South feared above all else, slave insurrection. Around 1.30 a.m. on October 17th, 1859, when Hayward Shepard left the B&O Depot for the bridge where he would unload the arriving train, two shadowy figures intercepted him and ordered him to halt. Either not understanding the command, not realizing it was directed at him, or simply ignoring it, he turned to retrace his steps back to the station. A few moments later, a shot rang out, striking Shepard in the back just below his heart. About 12 hours later, at about the same time that Brown and his surviving followers were being taken into custody by federal troops, Shepard died from his wound. Brown was executed for treason in December 1859. His raid is often described as the tragic prelude to the Civil War, and he was seen as a martyr for the cause of abolition by many in the North. Conversely, he was the very personification of the South's central fear elements from without invading the South and inciting slaves to violence. In the wake of the Civil War, the Southern cause to denigrate Brown's legacy only intensified. Moving back a bit, um, we're gonna talk about the myth of the faithful slave. In the 1830s, Senator John C. Calhoun articulated the idea that slavery was a positive good for both enslaver and enslaved. This new defense removes the Jeffersonian concern about the liberty of the enslaved because the new defense holds that while Blacks are indeed human beings, they are a naturally inferior subspecies of human who are rightfully placed below whites in the social hierarchy. The pro-slavery advocates of the mid-19th century often favorably compared the condition of the slave of the South with the free Black wage earner of the North. The former was cared for year round by a fatherly loving master, while the latter was merely a cog in a brutal and uncaring system. Any true and faithful slave, in their words, would recognize the schemes of northern inter interlopers who wanted to liberate them, only to use them as human fodder in their miserable industrialist cities. The faithful slave is therefore one who not only accepts, but welcomes that his natural and rightful position is that of perpetual bondage. The 1990, or excuse me, the 1890s saw the foundation of several Confederate heritage organizations, including the most prominent, the United Daughters of the Confederacy. The myth of the faithful slave was one of the favorites of the Confederate heritage organizations. For many members, the reason was personal. Much of the UDC rank and file was descended from the old South elite, and as the historian Karen L. Cox puts it, they were committed to, quote, perpetuating a benevolent image of their ancestors as kind masters of faithful servants, unquote. 
The official proposal to memorialize Shepard at Harper's Ferry came from UDC President General May McKinney at the 1920 United Daughters of the Confederacy Convention. In her statement, McKinney claims that, quote, in 1859, a faithful slave was murdered in Harper's Ferry by the hand of John Brown because he held too dear the lives of old Massa and old Misses to fulfill Brown's orders of rapine and murder, unquote. Note that McKinney refers to Shepard as a, quote, faithful slave, unquote, despite the well-known fact of Shepard's freedom. After a decade in storage because of logistical difficulties, the monument was finally erected in 1931. The National Park Service acquired all of Lower Town Harper's Ferry in the 1950s, including the memorial and the building against which it stands. This means that the Park Service was now in the uncomfortable position of having to maintain the, con the controversial monument. The rising tide of civil rights during the 1950s made monuments like the Hayward Shepherd Memorial even more controversial than they had been in the past. Two powerful advocates opposing the monument emerged in the second half of the 20th century. James A. Tolbert, president of the West Virginia NAACP, and George Rutherford, president of the Jeff Jefferson County, West Virginia NAACP. Tolbert and Rutherford, both longtime residents of Charlestown and as well as close friends and allies, held multiple meetings with Donald Campbell of the Park Service attempting to have the monument removed. Although sympathetic to their cause, Campbell informed the two men that it was out of his hands. I was fortunate enough to conduct multiple interviews with Mr. Rutherford, and he says of Tolbert, who passed away in 2017 and vehemently opposed the monument, quote, if he had his way, he'd take the doggone monument and throw it in the doggone middle of the doggone Potomac River, a sentiment corroborated by Tolbert's own words in multiple secondary sources. Tolbert had no illusions about the monument's historical veracity. He was quoted as saying, the only history is that Hayward Shepherd was killed, caught in the crossfire, unquote. The monument still stands in Harpers Ferry, West Virginia, alongside buildings restored to appear frozen in time by the Park Service. It sits in the same spot it always has on Potomac Street across from the railroad tracks 50 miles upriver from the nation's capital. Next to it is, an, is a small explanatory plaque placed by the Park Service in 1995 that attempts to contextualize the sentiments expressed on the boulder. Even today, according to Mr. Rutherford, the Jefferson County NAACP remains strongly opposed to the monument, but focuses much of its attention and resources on litigating police brutality cases. There has been no serious attempt to remove the monument in the 21st century because ironically, it is much more difficult to remove a Confederate monument that stands on federal land than one on municipal land or private property. Even now, Mr. Rutherford confessed in an interview with me, quote, we're still against the monument, but we've realized there's nothing we can do to stop it. Thank you for your time.